the Academy of Science St. Louis, and we're very pleased that you're able to join us here tonight for the last of our conservation conversations. Uh, this particular series will start up again next fall. Um, and we love partnering with the St. Louis Zoo to bring you these exciting and um, very informative talks. They are sponsored by, very generously underwritten and sponsored by Cooper Bussman. Um, so for those of you who are Academy members and friends, um, you already know who we are. And for those of you who do not, I'm going to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we're a local nonprofit. We've been around since 1856, so for a very long time. We have a long-standing mission to promote the public understanding of science, and we do that through a number of free and low-cost public science seminars and trips and tours that celebrate science at venues throughout the region. You can find more information on us on our website at academyofsciencestl.org. You can also visit us on Facebook or Twitter or pick up some of our literature that is on the visitor's desk just outside the auditorium, and it might not have been there when you got here this evening, but it is out there now. Um, if there are any students here tonight that need to verify their attendance, you come see me after the talk and I will have some stickers for you. Um, I do want to mention just a couple upcoming public science seminars that you might have an interest in attending on Tuesday, Tuesday, April 17th, that's next week, as part of our Perspectives on Science and History series with the Missouri History Museum and in partnership with the Thomas Jefferson School in the museum's Lee Auditorium from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., we have history professor and author Min Su Kang. He's addressing the long history of human interest in autonomy automata and how it provides clues to understanding our current ambivalence in the face of our artificial children in the coming war with robots, a historical perspective. Uh, the talk is followed by a discussion with a panel of experts on the future of robotics and prior to the talk there will be hands-on activities in the museum atrium. Uh, following the panel discussion there will be copies of Min Su's book, Sublime Dreams of Living Machines, that will be available for purchase and signing by the author. The event is free and open to the public. You don't need to register to attend and there is a flyer out on the visitor's desk about that particular event. Uh, on Thursday evening, April 26, here at the zoo and in celebration of the Friends of the Children's Eternal Rainforest, Dr. Peter Raven speaks on Saving the Rainforest, Saving Ourselves. The evening begins with a reception at 6 p.m. and coffee and dessert following the talk. You do need to register to attend and you can find information on registering again at our website, academyofsciencestl.org and there are flyers out on the visitor's desk about that particular talk as well. Um, and I think that's everything. With that said, I'm going to introduce Louise Bradshaw. She's the Zoo's Director of Education and she's going to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Cheryl Issa. Thank you, Rose. I'd also like to welcome you all to the St. Louis Zoo. And um, this is the end of our season, our school season for the conservation conversations and the science seminar series. Um, just want to really encourage you all to make sure you're on the mailing list that you know about these wonderful talks. We've been really fortunate to have the opportunity to present these to all of you at no charge, which is extremely exciting. And want to make sure to note that a lot of that is because of the sp support and sponsorship of Cooper Busman. We're very excited to have them helping us this year. Um, this partnership also is really benefited a lot by our relationship with the Academy who helps get the word out in oh so many ways. And so thank you also to the Academy. So by way of introducing my colleague, Sherry Asa, um, Sherry has worked here at the St. Louis Zoo for nearly 25 years. She's been the director of research for low many years. and. In those 25 years, many of you are probably aware that the zoo has undergone a pretty significant transformation on the outside. You know, we have River's Edge, we have our fragile forest, uh, Penguin Puffin, Monsanto Insectarium, I'm gonna forget everything. The Children's Zoo, you know, really 75%, if not 80% of the zoo has been transformed. But at the same time that that transformation on the public side has been happening, amazing work has been happening really kind of behind the scenes in areas of research and animal health, really significant work. And Sherry herself is really a leader within our zoo and aquarium profession, I think an unsung leader for some of our, some of our St. Louisans and some of our members. So I'm really thrilled to be able 
to have this opportunity to introduce her, have her share with you just a very small, teeny part of many years of work that she's done here, many years of work that she's done helping and supporting um, hundreds, probably, of graduate students, <laughs> interns. Um, and she's really been a wonderful partner in getting a lot of education things happening, too, in our local community with research. So without further ado, Dr. Cheryl Issa. Am I turned on, Sean? <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. And I'm always happy to talk about our research because I think, at least to me, we do a lot of exciting things. Uh, and this particular story is, well, when I was asked to give a talk and choosing among them what would be appropriate, this is a really great story, I think. Uh, there's a lot of work being done on endangered species around the world, and we don't have many success stories to talk about. And I'm gonna, I have the privilege of being able to tell you about some successes tonight, which is very gratifying and should be encouraging uh, because there, there are a lot of discouraging stories out there and there's certainly a lot of work left to be done. But I don't know if you've even heard of island foxes before, but <clears throat> they're endemic to islands off the coast of Southern California. So here we have Santa Barbara, Ventura, the Los Angeles metropolitan area, and down here is San Diego. So I've underlined the six of the eight islands where there are foxes. So here's San Clemente, Santa Catalina, San Nicolas, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and San Miguel. So I'm gonna talk with you tonight about what's happened to foxes on those islands. The history, so what are island foxes? Well, they're very much like gray foxes. So you, we have gray foxes here in Forest Park. They're very secretive. You probably aren't going to see them. You're more likely to see red foxes. But they're over, they're, their distribution is through much of the United States and even up into the southern part of Canada and down into the northern part of South America. And their diminutive cousin is this little guy that's out on the Channel Islands. So they're a separate species now. They used to be considered a subspecies of the gray fox but now they're given their own species status. And they dispersed from the mainland, perhaps helped by Native Americans, out to the islands, variously put at 10 to 20,000 years ago, depending on which island. I worked mostly on the three northernmost islands, so I'm gonna be uh, prejudiced toward information there because I know more about those islands. But now, uh, each of the islands is considered to have a separate subspecies. So that's been determined by doing molecular genetics work. So they're managed separately. So of the six islands that have foxes, four of those islands then have an endangered subspecies. So the ones listed on the left. The two islands on the right, San Clemente and San Nicolas, don't have an endangered subspecies. There, there are foxes there, but they're not listed as endangered. But they've still faced some problems that smack in many ways of endangered species kinds of uh, challenges. So starting with San Clemente. So I'm going to step you through these and tell you a story about each of those six islands. So San Clemente, that's the one off um, San Diego, the southernmost island. And it's owned by the Navy. And the island is used primarily as a test range. So it's not a terribly safe place to, to be, but uh, we must also be appreciative that the Navy takes very seriously uh, the ecology of the island. And they have hired, they have a whole staff of ecologists that monitor species there. And one of the things they have to do is take care of the loggerhead shrike. So the loggerhead shrike, the bird that you see here, is endangered. The subspecies of fox on this island is not endangered. So the problem that occurred was in the 1990s, they found that the foxes were predating shrike nests. So shrikes are endangered, they have to be protected. So the Navy personnel, the ecologists, were then, they decided they had to trap and remove foxes, and so they were trapping and killing foxes. And the zoo community found out about it and called right away and said, we'll take them. Don't euthanize them. The zoo community will take them in and start a breeding program or an education program. You know, we'll take the foxes. So they entered in a cooperative program to do that. And uh, the 
<coughs> an organization then uh, was put together, Friends of the Island Fox, and so they run a lot of education programs and they raise funds for uh, Island Fox conservation. And <coughs> here you see the kids have, uh, they're holding up a replica of a check for some money that they've raised for Island Fox programs like buying radio collars <coughs> and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me, but then back to foxes and shrikes. So that's what was going on in terms of zoos. But they still had to deal with foxes on the island, and they didn't want to have to euthanize all of them. They didn't want to have to move them all into zoos. They wanted to somehow come up with a balance. And so <coughs> some ingenious people at the Institute for Wildlife Services, or Wildlife Studies, put together this proposal of, and I call it a magic fence. I think it's all officially called an invisible fence. So some of you, does anyone have something like that for your dog? So you have the little collar and they learn <coughs> where the border of your, your yard is. Well, they put that invisible fence around the primary nesting areas of the shrikes and they put the collars on the foxes. And it worked like magic, it worked very well. So foxes then were basically trained to stay away from nesting areas. And that might not have worked forever, um, but it turns out for the several years that this program was in force, then the Shrike numbers gradually increased, so they got to the point where they were considered, they're still on the endangered species list, but they're considered more stable, and they can actually absorb some fox predation. So they seem to be in a kind of balance now. Okay, so that's the nutshell of what was happening on San Clemente. Then moving up the coast a little bit to Santa Catalina, uh, which is off the coast of Los Angeles. And it's uh, managed by an organization called the Catalina Conservancy, but it's managed mostly for recreation. There are actually some permanent homes there, and there is a lot of boat traffic from the Los Angeles area out to the island. Beaches and uh, a lot of like snorkeling and uh, yeah, uh, sort of island coastal activity. So there are a lot of people around. And so the problem for the foxes came into being when they discovered distemper. And so almost all the foxes on the island ended up being wiped out because of the distemper outbreak. And the only ones that remained, that one's not working very well, over here on, there's an isthmus here, a really tiny isthmus. And so the foxes on the east, or on the, West End here, uh, were isolated, and so the, some of those remained. And so what they did was then bring the rest of them into captivity and start a captive breeding program. And here's an um, aerial view of the captive breeding uh, pens that they created. And then they set up a vaccination program for uh, the foxes that they captured. But the other thing that was important was education for the people who were coming to the island because they were bringing dogs, they wanted to make sure that people knew if they were bringing dogs or keeping dogs on the island, that they had to be vaccinated for distemper as well, so it would prevent another outbreak like this from happening. But the program was very successful, and the captive breeding program worked well, and so after a couple of years, they were able to release the foxes, and they, the monitoring program has shown that they've survived and they're reproducing a success story. San Nicolas Island, so I neglected to mention when I was talking about San Clem on Santa Catalina, the foxes there during the period of time when they were in captivity and the distemper um, abatement program was going on, they were listed as endangered by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, the San Nicolas foxes, though, the population hasn't uh, had too much of a problem and they're not considered an endangered subspecies, but it is a really small population. And the genetics work that's been done has shown that they are very inbred, and so that leaves them vulnerable, and so they're being watched very carefully for any potential problems. But the biggest activity that's gone on that has affected foxes has been the problem with feral cats. So there were hundreds of feral cats on the island. And this is another island that's owned by the Navy, and so the Navy is in charge of managing it. And they decided a few years ago that what they really needed to do to maintain ecological balance and to prevent cats from bringing um, 
<clears throat> maybe distemper or another disease into the fox population that they needed to get rid of the cats. And so they instituted a trapping program, a trap and translocation program, in coordination with the Humane Society of the U.S. and some local California humane organizations that then took the cats when they were brought to the mainland. And the most recent report that I saw was that in February of this year, just a couple of months ago, this program finally could say it had been completely successful, that they believe they have removed all the cats. And that's an incredible feat. There are a lot of places that are dealing with feral cats. Of course, it's easier on an island because you've got a contained population. But still, cats are secretive, cats are small, and they do believe that they've trapped and moved off all of them. And I'm not sure how successful the humane societies have been in finding homes for them, but that's been their intent. Uh, there is a remaining problem on these three islands. There are, there's vehicular traffic on all these islands. So Santa Catalina has the tourists and then the Navy with their vehicles and other things <laughs> on, on San Clemente and on San Nicolas. And so being hit by vehicles is the major uh, type of uh, mortality right now for these foxes. So on these islands, they've actually got fox crossing signs and education programs telling people drive carefully when you see these signs because there are foxes on the road and foxes seem not to know very well about how to avoid vehicles. So this is the major problem they're facing right now. <clears throat> Okay, so those are the three southernmost islands, and the northernmost ones are the ones where I worked along with people in my lab. And so these are San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and these are off the coast of Ventura and then Santa Barbara, depend on, depending on which angle you come in from. We typically uh, would uh, go out by boat from Ventura, sometimes fly. So the history of these islands, and it's important to know something of the history to understand the problems that ensued. And so they were, all three of them, previously the site of ranches that had livestock, just typical livestock. In fact, this is a scene that still is there on Santa Cruz. The Nature Conservancy owns a small part of Santa Cruz Island. The National Park Service owns the, uh, the other half of it, and the other two islands. But this ranch is considered historic, and so it still exists on uh, Santa Cruz on that part of the island. And this is the setting for the, the T.C. Boyle book. Uh, and what's the name of the book you were telling me? When the Killing is Finished. I actually have a copy that someone gave me, but I haven't read it yet. But it was, um, it was set and on this island, and it was about the woman from the Nature Conservancy who worked with foxes there. So I recommend the book. I hear it's very good. And I'm going to read it soon. <laughs> uh, OK, so then in 1980, these three islands were designated as national parks, and their management was taken over by National Park Service. On the one island, it was in cooperation with the Nature Conservancy, as I mentioned. They are really beautiful, remote, rocky islands. This is the National Park Service headquarters on San Miguel. Um, beautiful, you know, like climbs down to the beach, a lot of uh, sea mammals and such. And they had to remove all the livestock because these are now national parks. They couldn't catch all the pigs. Pigs go feral easily, uh, so they were able to remove all the horses, all the sheep, all the cows. They didn't remove all the pigs. And the pig numbers uh, became amazing <laughs> on Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz. And they were definitely changing the ecology and the look of the island. OK, but now shifting a little, because there are a number of pieces to this puzzle. So I'll give you each of them and then bring it together. In the 1960s, and some of you are as old as I and know this story, uh, but before or about the time we were learning that DDT could be a problem, DDT was being spilled or dumped, depending on whose story you believe. Uh, off the coast of Los Angeles. And something that DDT does is an organic chemical. It can accumulate then in the wildlife that are consuming the food that it's part of. And so it's especially accumulating in fish. 
the next part of this story is the effect on bald eagles. So bald eagles eat primarily fish. So they're getting uh, more and more concentrated amounts of DDT in their system, which, which results in eggshell thinning. And so because then that compromises their ability to reproduce, bald eagles basically disappeared from the islands after having been there for eons. Uh, the next point then of the problem, this is a very complex web, but that's what ecology is and that's what's important to understand about the challenges that biologists face when they have to deal with conservation issues. So bald eagles, uh, at least what I'm told by ecologists, and I don't know birds well myself, but that bald eagles usually deter golden eagles. They're ge generally concerned, considered to be dominant to golden eagles. So bald eagles are nesting on the island, and golden eagles had always been on the California mainland, but had made some hunting forays out to the island, weren't seen commonly, and hadn't been documented ever nesting on the islands. When the bald eagles disappeared, then it seems that golden eagles took advantage of that opportunity, spent more time on the islands, and began to nest there. And this was facilitated by, or you might say exacerbated by, the pigs. So back to the pig part of the story. So there are feral pigs on these islands, and in the spring, when the golden eagles are nesting, the baby pigs make a perfect size package to take back to the nest to the baby eaglets. And so that encourages then golden eagles to nest on the islands because they've got this perfect food source available when they need to feed their chicks. Uh, bald eagles hadn't paid much attention apparently from what we can tell. They're eating mostly fish and other marine life. So as the pigs then get larger, the piglets are growing, they get a little too big for the golden eagles to be able to take easily. And so what the ecologists, the picture they've put together, and there's much documentation on now, is that the, as the piglets would be getting bigger, then the eagles would switch to foxes. These foxes are really small. They typically weigh less than five pounds. They're, they're smaller than many kinds of cats. And so they then stay a good size for a golden eagle to take year round. So there is a glut of food in the spring when the piglets are born, and then there's a steady amount of food year round of the foxes. So this is a great situation for eagles. And so the foxes had never evolved a defense against eagles because they had lived for thousands of years in a habitat where they had no predator at all. They're tiny, but they were the top predator on the island. So what does all this mean for the foxes? Well, the populations crashed. So in the late 1900s, one island at a time began to crash in population. San Miguel first, down to 15 animals, uh, after a peak of something in the hundreds, like three or 400. Uh, then Santa, Santa Rosa was next, a year later, down to 30 animals. They saw what was happening, and they started trapping them and pulling them out of the wild sooner. One year after that, Santa Cruz population crashed, didn't get quite as low. They, again, they saw what was happening, started trapping sooner. So, next one. Conservation actions, and so I got called in in 1998, and each year the National Park Service would have an annual meeting in Ventura, where their headquarters were, to bring together various experts to work on, I mean, you can see how complex this problem is. There are, someone has to deal with pigs, someone has to deal with eagles, someone has to deal with habitat, and then there was captive breeding of foxes. So um, I brought expertise in reproductive physiology and reproductive management of canids, and other zoo folks came with information about husbandry of foxes and other kinds of small canids, and population geneticists from zoos um, making recommendations. But uh, by 2004, then the fox, the four subspecies were listed as endangered officially by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and one of the first conservation actions was to get bald eagles back on the island. Because you've got to, got to do something to deter golden eagles. So they started bringing bald eagles back, introducing them, 
and facilitating the circumstance for them to be able to nest and reproduce. And I was actually out on Santa Cruz at the time the crew first found an, um, an egg in a bald eagle nest of one of the reintroduced birds, and there was a huge celebration that night. I mean, like, it's starting to work. Um, and so just having bald eagles out there might not be enough, uh, because the golden eagles are still there in force. It, it would take much longer to wait for the bald eagle population to reach the point where they'd be able to deter, deter all of the, the golden eagles. So they started capturing golden eagles. The first ones weren't so difficult, but by the time they got to the last one, uh, it was quite a challenge. They're very smart animals. They captured them all. None of it was done lethally. Nothing was killed. Um, they captured them, and they radio tagged them, and they moved them. So here's where the island is, the, the islands, that, the northern islands. They moved them and released them on the other side of the mountains in northeastern California. And because they had radio tags on them, they could document they stayed. A lot of people said, oh, they'll just come back. They didn't. It was amazing. Oh, and they also then had to remove uh, the feral pigs. And so they brought special like hunters in from New Zealand who specialize in this kind of removal. These were, these were not wildlife. These are domestic pigs gone feral. So they had originally been bred to be used for food, these weren't eaten, but they were killed. So there wasn't a rationale for moving feral pigs from one place to another. They went in and killed them. So meanwhile, while that's going on out in the field, then we're working with foxes in these, these captive facilities. And it had to all be done on the island because California has a quarantine law. If you take any of those animals from the islands onto the mainland, you can't take them back out. So all the pens had to be built out there. All of the quarters for the people taking care of them had to be established out there. So it was quite an operation. Uh, OK, so uh, zoos then, as I was starting to say a little earlier, got uh, involved because, and I don't know how much you're aware of this or if you've had been exposed to this in other lectures that people have given, but the zoo community really did pioneer small population management. We, by, def by definition, are working with small populations uh, in our zoos in North America and around the world. And in fact, in each zoo, there may just be a few individuals. Even when we sort of pool our resources and count all of the animals that we have in uh, larger populations, there still may only be a few hundred of any particular species. So genetic management is really important so that you're, we, we call it equalizing representation of founders. And all that really means is the original animals you brought into captivity, and most of the time that was in the early 1900s, there might just be, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 of them. And in each generation, you want to maintain as many of their genes as possible so you maintain that diversity that represents those original wild founders. But also in each generation, when you're choosing individuals to mate with each other, you have to be aware of the possibility of inbreeding and avoid that. And it really is very similar when you look at uh, conservation uh, problems that in reintroduced populations, that's by definition a small population. Uh, and also when species go through bottlenecks, then you've got small populations with limited founder uh, individuals. So zoos have a lot of experience doing that, and they then came in to also help with island fox breeding. Our particular role had to do with managing and monitoring reproduction. So one of the things we did was take fecal samples, uh, because hormones from animals show up in their feces. It's very convenient. Uh, it's probably more pleasant to work with blood samples, but it's easier to collect fecal samples. Uh, with captive animals, keepers have to clean that up every day anyway. So if they just put it in a bag and put it in the freezer, we have samples and we can tell them then what the hormones are. And so this is Joan Bauman, who are, was our endocrinologist for about 15 years. She retired last fall, and I now need to realize when I was putting this together, I need to get a picture of our new endocrinologist, Corinne Kozlowski. Uh, but the lab is still working the same way. and so. I want to give you a little bit of data, not a whole lot. I know this is an evening lecture. Um, but we have 
increases in estradiol over here, and estradiol increases when a female is in estrus. A common way to say that is when the female's in heat, when she's attractive to a male and interested in mating. And then when progesterone goes up, that's after ovulation, and in this case the female's pregnant. So progesterone is the progestational hormone, so that supports pregnancy. So this was a nice curve that looks like what we would see for other canid species that we had studied. But this was a surprise because a number of the females had profiles like this. They had not ovulated. They hadn't even come into estrus. And so when we looked carefully and called uh, out to the islands and got uh, data on what the housing was for each of these individual females, it turned out that all the females that were paired with a male had ovulated, and all the females that were housed either alone or with another female, because at this particular time there were more females than males in the population, none of those females ovulated. This had never been reported for a canid. It's common for felids, the cat-like animals, and for weasels and ferrets and things like that. It's not, it's never been reported before for a canid. All of the other canids are considered to ovulate spontaneously, like humans do, whether a male is around or not. So we started thinking, well, why would island foxes be different? And then we thought, aha, gray fox is the ancestor, the immediate ancestor of the island fox. And the uh, gray fox is considered what's called the most ancestral of the canids. So here's a family tree. These are all the canids, and here, is island fox or gray fox. So here's island, here's gray, and their line goes all the way back to where it splits from the other carnivores. So if here for other carnivores, it's mentioning black bear, giant panda, elephant seal, walrus, but that also would include all the cats, uh, weasels, raccoons, uh, and, you know, all of the other carnivores. And the other canids, this pointer isn't showing up really well, are then much more recently derived. So what we're wondering is that because most of the other carnivores are induced ovulators, then maybe the gray fox and island fox are actually more primitive and more like the other carnivores than they are like the other canids that we know today that are more derived. But it, once we started looking at the literature, we really don't have good data for many of the canid species on this because it's never been carefully studied in most of the species. We know a lot about wolves and about red foxes because they've been bred a lot in captivity, but many of the other species we really don't have good data. So it might even be more common in canids than anyone has ever uh, reported. Okay, so that's some basic science, and that was an important discovery, but back to the problem. <laughs> so um, after these original pairs had been brought in and began to reproduce, uh, and we looked at the success rate, about half of them were not producing pups. And so our challenge, <laughs> our charge, was to find out why. So one of the first things we did, we knew that all the females that had been housed, here we go, had been housed with males were ovulating, so that looked right. Um, but what about the males? So the next season we went out and we collected semen from 18 of the male foxes, half of them had been successful before, had produced pups, so we knew this is at least the minimum of what it takes for a male to be fertile, a male fox, and then we looked at the other half that had not been successful, and it turned out there was really no difference in the quality of their sperm. So males were not responsible, at least male fertility was not responsible for the reproductive failures. But as time was going on, another season passed, and then it became apparent that the original foxes that were captured and brought into captivity were actually reproducing better than their offspring were. And this is backwards from what we would expect. Because typically, when you bring animals into captivity, they're having to acclimate, they're more stressed, they're more likely to have problems reproducing, at least in the first few years. But captive-born animals, this is the life they know, they're not stressed by it, they're used to it they're very likely to have high reproductive rates. We were seeing the opposite of that. Uh, so we started thinking, well, what are the differences? Well, maybe there's just something about the way they're being raised in captivity. Uh, we really didn't know what goes on out in the wild with them. They hadn't been carefully studied. 
But we also knew that when the trapping was being done, if a male and female were trapped near each other, it was assumed they were a pair and they were put together then in the captive breeding program. So they had chosen each other. So we thought maybe that's part of the problem. We're selecting their mates based on genetic relationships that have been determined by molecular genetic analyses and maybe what they really need is to be able to choose their own partners. Uh, so we were then charged with, okay, figure out what you can, collect the kind of data that you can, and see if you can determine where the failure is happening. So at what point are, it's like, if they don't like each other, then maybe they're not courting and they're not mating. And then we know that's the problem and we know to change something at that level. But if it's happening later in the process, reproduction isn't just put a male and female together and over here you get puppies. There are a lot of things that have to go on in between. And all those have to work right. So we were given a grant by USGS, that's US Geological Survey, which is the parent organization of US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to do this project. And so we could look at all these different levels in the reproductive process. So we could look at estrus, which is the female then getting ready to uh, being willing to mate, and we can just look at estradiol. So if her estradiol level goes up, that should support uh, estrus behavior. And then uh, we put in uh, video cameras, I'll show you those in a moment and how that worked, uh, to be able to look at their courtship patterns and did they actually mate. Uh, and then we could determine whether a female ovulated, we already knew that by looking at progesterone levels. There isn't a measure of conception, so we couldn't determine like right after um, fertilization if the female was pregnant. We couldn't tell until she was two or three weeks along, but at that point, we could use ultrasound or a hormone called relaxin to determine whether she was pregnant. And then, of course, at parturition, when she's giving birth, we can use video again. The keepers would go do regular pup checks. And then whether they're showing proper parental care, or whether the pups are healthy, again, by video or by doing pup checks. And all along, we were using fecal samples to monitor cortisol levels as an indirect measure of stress. <clears throat> so here is the video setup. We're out on these islands. There's no electricity. <laughs> You're on your own. So uh, we had solar panels at every pen. My pointer isn't as, here we go. So there, a solar panel at every pen. And a box then that would house, a waterproof box that would house a DVR system and a marine battery to store um, energy when the sun wasn't shining. A camera here is being mounted in the pen. And here's what a setup looks like. So there's a little fox in here, here's a pen, and then here's the solar panel. And this is what the video footage, this, the, the images look like. And so we've had a lot of interns come through in the last few years who have reviewed all of this for us. So we're right now, we just finished at the end of this past semester with all the video review and we're just now starting to do the intensive analysis of it. But I have some preliminary uh, results that I can tell you about tonight. But then the next thing we could do along the way was ultrasound exams. So this is, you might be able to tell, this is going on in a tent. So it has to happen out on the island. Uh, and so one of our colleagues, uh, Deanna Clifford, uh, was doing the ultrasound exams. And you can kind of see, so here's a vessel with a little bit of, you can, maybe you can see the embryo in there. It's a little clearer here. Here's an embryo. And here's a scan with two embryos, one next to each other. So we can tell that they're pregnant. And then our lab would do an assay of relaxin to confirm that if they couldn't see uh, anything on ultrasound. So we found out again, we confirmed. All the females uh, that were with males were ovulating, and so virtually all of them are then able to get pregnant. In fact, most of them were conceiving, so most of them were determined to be pregnant at the time of the ultrasound check. And so the losses were happening in late pregnancy or around the time that the pups were born. Also, from the video analysis, we were seeing what looked to us like pretty serious aggression in every pair, and that was not typical of canids. But they also were spending a lot of time in proximity and even in contact with each other, which is what mated, bonded pairs of canids usually do. So that was conflicting information. So when we look at other species, 
Most embryonic losses happen in the first couple of weeks, not late in gestation. It's actually a sign of something really wrong if it happens late gestation. It's actually quite typical. Up to 50 or 60 percent of embryos are lost very early in, uh, across all species, are lost very early right after fertilization. And so there are a number of different factors that might come into play, including uh, thyroid hormone levels, just genetic defects, inbreeding, disease problems, uh, stress, or endocrine disruptors were things that we had to consider. If a pup dies near the time it's born, that might just be birth complications. And so, unfortunately, the females didn't always give birth where we thought they were, and so we didn't, we, they should, and so we didn't always have good camera coverage. If we put a camera in the den, then she would go under the bush over here. If we had the camera out here pointed this place, then she'd go find a nook and cranny behind the den or something. Uh, so we didn't have really good video of them giving birth. Uh, but we know that you know, congenital conditions, disease, the kinds of things that would happen in late pregnancy could also cause neonatal death. But the other problem that we are concerned about is parent-caused. Uh, death. So if parents aren't taking good care of the pups, then they might not survive. And some of the females actually were diagnosed with mastitis, uh, which is an infection of the mammary glands and weren't able to nurse. So those pups then had to be pulled for hand uh, rearing. And parents are, of, of most carnivores, eat their young if the young die. And it sounds disgusting, but it actually is better ecologically than leaving a carcass there to rot and attract other predators or attract um, uh, parasites and such. So parents could be killing offspring, or they might just be eating offspring that are already dead. So that's really difficult to determine. Um, we looked at cortisol, and we found no difference in uh, females that successfully gave birth and those that lost their pregnancies. So even though that was something we'd worried about because of the aggression that we were seeing, it turned out not to be a factor. Uh, yes, yeah, so I just mentioned this. And the pair compatibility, we, don't, we still aren't sure we understand. There was a lot of this cuddling together and sleeping together. And this looks like they love each other, they're getting along fine, and yet, especially during the courtship and mating period, there's an incredible amount of aggression that we were seeing. So uh, we recruited a graduate student and were able to pay her off the grant uh, to do uh, a particular kind of multivariate analysis to look at any of the factors that we could identify and measure that might be related to reproductive success. And so she was at University of Massachusetts in Amherst, but she did the research with us out on the islands. Um, and in all of the review of the video that we had done, and we're going to be repeating that now because at the time she finished her thesis, we hadn't reviewed all the video. We chose some select, uh, even number of successful and unsuccessful that she could finish in time to get her degree. And now we have an additional number of pairs to add to that. But at the time that she did her analysis, we could find no difference in aggression levels between successful and unsuccessful pairs. Uh, but she did find that reproductive success was lower in some of the conditions, just physical conditions, like how close together the pens were built or how exposed the pens were to wind and such. And so that seemed to make a difference. And even though this didn't play into reproductive success, it was interesting that personality profiles emerged for foxes on each of the islands. So on San Miguel Islands, and this confirmed what the keepers were telling us, and we actually then were able to document this quantitatively, that the San Miguel Island foxes were the most aggressive. Uh, intermediate was the Santa Rosa Island uh, animals, and lowest was the Santa Cruz Island foxes. Uh, and so I don't know why this, if just a founder effect, the genes that were represented in the animals on those islands, or if there's something else that we haven't yet identified. But also captive-born males were more aggressive than the wild-caught males. Uh, so trying to then figure out what's going on. Might this be an artifact of captivity? So aspects of mate choice or space. We don't think mate choice is a big factor because they all did 
court and mate, and the females were getting pregnant, so they were at least compatible to that extent. Uh, space might be at issue because of the results that Betsy found. And we still need to know a lot more about rearing conditions, like how the parents really in the wild would be uh, associating with and taking care of their young. But something we know in terms of aggression about other canids is that males are really solicitous of females. They're all monogamous. Males defer to females. Males take care of females when they're denning. They bring food to them. Males take care of the kids when they're born. They bring food. They babysit. They play with them. They're really tolerant with them. They're ideal mates and ideal dads. And so what we were seeing in island foxes just doesn't fit the mold or the model that has emerged for other canids. So then we stepped back and thought, well, is this another factor that's relating them to the other carnivores? So other carnivores aren't monogamous, and other carnivore males are more aggressive, and in particular during the mating period, mating of cats, I don't know if you've ever seen cats mate, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> And it can look pretty vicious. There's a lot of hissing and snarling and slapping and jumping around and growling. And especially if it's tigers, it's even more impressive. But there's a lot of obvious aggression, neck biting, uh, the male you know, biting the neck of the female as part of courtship and the early stages of mounting. And so when I've watched mating of island foxes on video, they look like cats to me. So one of the things we're wondering is maybe, and, and also like ferrets and weasels and mink mate in that way. It's, it's that very aggressive uh, kind of look. So maybe this is another factor. Remember this, this diagram from earlier on where you have gray fox and island fox being clo more closely related to the other carnivores than they are to the rest of the canids, that maybe this factors into their courtship and mating behavior as well. So we still have a lot of questions. We're working with veterinarians to uh, do more analyses of what might be causing late-term abortions. And then we're looking more at behavior. And we don't have them in captivity anymore, which is a good thing for the foxes, that they could be released into the wild. But it's disappointing for us that we still have so many questions that we'd like to get answers to. Um, like, uh, are they really monogamous? Do males and females stay together year round? Uh, what is their territory home range? How, how do they associate? So were we keeping them too close together? Would they spend that much time together in the wild? And at what age do the kids disperse? Like, are, how much time do they spend with, with, uh, off, with their parents? So there are a lot of questions about just natural behavior that we were perhaps not mimicking appropriately. But, Overall, and again, like I can't complain that it's been a success story. I can complain just a little that we didn't get to answer all of our research questions. But the reason we don't have access to them now is that the ecologists were so successful in correcting the imbalances in the ecosystem on these islands that they were able to re successfully release foxes again. Because even though we were focused on the ones that were having problems reproducing, there were plenty of others. About half of the population, at least in any particular year, was producing pups so that we still were getting uh, a growth in the population. And so they were able to be released uh, about two and a half years ago, and they're doing well. The other thing that's encouraging is that they're still being monitored, so we're beginning to learn something about their natural behavior in the wild, which we never knew before. Um, and so one of the things, they're, they're radio tracking, but they're also doing periodic trapping. Uh, so they're getting uh, direct data. So here's a pup in the trap, obviously very comfortable being in there while mom's watching. Uh, and their reproductive success rate in the wild is very good. Most of them are reproducing, and the pups are surviving. And just in the last week, I've been corresponding with a colleague of mine, Kathy Rawls, who is out working on, the, well, one of her students is out working on the islands right now, and they have these great collars that are called contact collars. So they, I can't remember right now how many she said she has, but they're on a number of foxes in the population. So if another fox gets within three meters of you, you've got a collar on, and the other fox has one of the collars as well, if you come within three meters of each other, it's noted on each of the collars. 
And so over time then, she can then remotely download that information and look at association patterns. How much time are individuals spending near each other, at least within three meters of each other? And so here's uh, a graph that she sent me. So this is for one of the pairs from last year. Uh, so here's January and February, and here's the, what we're assuming is the mating period. That's when it would, time-wise, we think would occur. So this is how much time the male and female were spending together on, and each of the bars is a different day. So that was encouraging, but then here's the pattern for that same pair of foxes through the whole year last year. They did produce pups that were successful. Here they are mating in February. So here's what you just looked at. Here's when she would be giving birth. He's there for what looks like three days for a few hours, and he disappears. He's not with her. It appears he's not helping her. Other male canids would be there all the time. They would be feeding the kids and taking care of things. He's not there. This is a, um, a, a camera trap photo that was taken a couple of years ago somewhere else on the islands. And when we saw, this is some kind of big fat rodent hanging out of this animal's mouth. And I was told by the biologist doing this that this was a male. And so the assumption was he's taking that home, but we're not seeing evidence of den attendance here. So we're now really confused about what the male's role is and how much time they really spend together. So she's got three other uh, pairs of foxes that she's got profiles on, and they basically look the same. So they're not spending a lot of time together. So that's something else, again, that is in contrast with the rest of the canids that we know about. So we don't have all the answers. This is becoming one of my favorite slides. The questions outnumber the answers. Um, but the other way to look at it for a biologist, it's, it's job insurance, maybe. <laughs> There's always more that we need to do. Uh, and it is still fascinating, and we'll keep working on it, and we'll keep looking, and hope that over time, then a, a more reasonable pattern shows up. So right now, I think we have a lot of fascinating data, uh, but we've certainly got a lot of questions. But overall, I mean, what a great success story in just a little over 10 years that the islands were basically put back in a condition where foxes could survive again, and so the Park Service is beginning to talk about petitioning U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to delist the foxes. So they want to wait for maybe another year or so to make sure that the populations stay stable. But, I mean, how many success stories do you know about uh, in terms of endangered species recovery? And something as complex as this, and they were able to make it work in such a short period of time, and with so many different challenges on each of those islands. So I hope you feel encouraged and that you learned something and are now maybe fascinated by foxes. And I wanted to acknowledge the people who helped and who helped also helped fund uh, the work that we did over that 10 years. And I'd be happy to entertain questions if you still have any energy. <laughs> Thank you. It's, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain. Um, we had, yeah, we had to go through, because we have a lot of interns, and they have to be able to look at it the same way. So it had to be contact, chasing, like rolling, in a, and in a context where you could tell it wasn't playing. Um, and you ha if you watch the video for a while, so what we do is sit with them, and we go through different sequences, and look at the signs that would tell you, well, this could be play, but this looks like it's not. Um, and so it's, and it happened most of the time, like I said, when the female was, it was clear she was coming into estrus because of her tail deflection and such, and the way the male would jump on the female and bite her neck, and they would then go rolling, and then she would jump up and run away from him and go hide that didn't look like play. Both, yeah. Yeah. No, uh, it is amazing for canids. This seems to have happened. This is the third species that this has worked with. 
they seem to know what to do. So Mexican wolves have been reintroduced after only being in captivity. Uh, red wolves have been reintroduced after only being in captivity. All the others were gone. Um, and they know how to hunt right away. And we can't explain why, but it's there. And for these animals as well, there was no training that went on to teach them how to find food again. The lucky thing for them, uh, they're a small animal, so they could have a predator and they did when golden eagles were there. It's much more difficult when you are introducing a species that you have to teach them to avoid predators. So finding food seems to be less of a problem than having to train them to avoid danger. So once the golden eagles were gone and the foxes were back to being top predator, that wasn't a problem. And they knew how to find food. Yeah. Um, it's when there's something going on in a population that causes the numbers to decline, so it's, it's likened sort of pictorially to a bottleneck, that the numbers decrease over time until you have very few of them. So if you were plotting your population size in each year and saying, this bar represented how many animals you know, each year, and as that gets smaller, then the bottleneck is when you have very few animals left in the population. There is a concern by the National Park Service on the three no northern islands because there are campers out there. And so they're worried, in fact, there is a, a, a photo I didn't put up of a fox getting into a garbage can. Uh, and so they're worried about foxes getting too acclimated to people and going to campsites to beg food. And I would be more worried about that if it was a wolf. <laughs> These foxes are little bitty guys, so I don't think they pose any danger to humans. They could become pesty, but it's not the kind of worry we have, like for Mexican wolf, where if, they come, if they're used to people and they come into human, human habitation, they're likely to get into real trouble. Uh, but humans don't seem to interact with them otherwise on the islands. There, no, and it, around the campsites, apparently some of them will get a little bit tame, um, you know, because they become aware that there's a potential food source. But otherwise, they, there aren't that many people around. So two of the islands are navy, and they're busy with other things. They're not out, you know, looking for foxes to pet. Uh, Santa Catalina might be a problem because there are so many humans around. But because there are also a lot of dogs. And, and domestic cats that are owned cats, then foxes tend not to be close to the towns where people are. It's when people take the roads you know, more out into the back country that they can potentially hit a fox. But the foxes tend not to live up near the towns or the beaches where there are a lot of people. Yeah. No, there's no record of them interbreeding with anything. Uh, they're I would think they're, they're too remote from a domestic dog to be able to successfully interbreed, even if it was a small dog. Uh, they're, a, they're a very different species. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible, and we just hope that the pet owners are being responsible and not letting them go feral. Um, and I've not heard any reports, and that would only be a problem on Santa Catalina, where there are people living year-round. It's not big communities, but there are some. And I've not heard any reports of feral cats there. It doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but there's no, there's no population of feral cats now. How they ended up on San Nicolas, I'm not sure. You know, that's one of the Navy islands. So there was probably someone who, you know, brought a few out because, you know, they were stationed out there for a while and... I don't know. They, but by the time I was working on the project, those, those cats had been out there for decades. So no one knows for sure how the population started. Yeah, back there.
Yeah, and that's the, the, the parameters that come with the collars from the company. So that's what they've been tested uh, as the minimum range, is that anything within three meters is supposed to register. And so that's actually not my project. It's just something she sent me data and just said, what do you think's going on here? Uh, you know, just to ask for my feedback. And so I asked her some basic questions about how the collars worked. And she feels like that they've tested them adequately, that that is accurate. And three meters is pretty far away. I mean, that's not, I mean, to, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't score something as being in proximity unless it was about a body length away from the other animal. So this is, yeah, it's about 10 feet. Um, so that's pretty generous saying that the other animal came within 10 feet. No, it's just the numbers were growing, and because of the distemper outbreak on Santa Catalina, they thought, you know, this is just ripe for disease problems, and then if it happens, what are we going to do? And also, a lot of, ten of attention had been brought to the islands uh, because of all the conservation problems and the concerns, for instance, with the feral pigs on the northern islands. And uh, there were, and one of the other islands, uh, not one of the ones in this chain, but uh, up up further along the coast, so it had been an issue for San Francisco. Uh, they were eradicating domestic rats, <laughs> and you know, so depending on what's there, it's affecting the ecological balance in some way. And so I think they thought, you know, since at least what was reported at the meeting, and I never worked on San Nicolas, but you know, each year uh, there would be an update on what's what are the problems on each island and what steps are being taken. So each year as they were talking about the problem with the cats, it was just growing concern with the number of cats increasing and that meant an increasing chance of a disease uh, you know, coming in and spreading and wiping out foxes or something else. Plus the cats were predating on a lot of other species that weren't our immediate concern, but you know, ground nesting birds and some of the indigenous rodents so as a feral animal that was having an effect on you know, the indigenous animals in that ecosystem, they felt they should remove them. Yeah? Yeah, I think you would have more of a chance of seeing them on uh, like Santa Rosa or Santa Cruz on the northern islands, the national park islands, uh, because the foxes aren't disturbed as, or you can't go to the Navy islands. And Santa Catalina, uh, you know, where the foxes are is out and very remote. But because foxes are documented coming into fo to campsites, people do see them on those islands. And so ferries run out to those islands on, you know, you can go on the web and, you know, get the ferry schedules and they'll take you to landings that are near, you know, various campsites and such. You know, it, it operates like a national park. So I think there would be a fair chance of seeing foxes there. Yeah, there are some other very endangered foxes on an island off South America on the Pacific coast, Darwin's fox. And so that's uh, the subject of uh, endangered species recovery work right now. No, no, it's a, it's a different species. In fact, it's a different genus off South America. Yeah, so the South American foxes are in a different genus. Hmm? Yeah, over here. Um, yeah, actually, that's a good question. Yeah, there. I guess you'd call it a base. I don't. I don't know military terminology that well. But yeah, there are there are permanent installations on each of the Navy islands, so it's active. You know, there's ongoing work uh, on both of those islands all the time. There are people in residence there uh, from the Navy. They seem not to. Of course, I guess it depends on you know where munitions are being tested, and 
if foxes happen to be around, but that seems not to be, it's not reported to be a problem, that the fox density is low enough, it's reported not to be a problem. And I don't know how often they are blowing things up. I know it still happens, but I don't know how often it happens or how extensive. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. I thought I saw another. Yeah, Hanton. Yeah, potential limit to growth. I, there's got to be a carrying capacity in just in terms of the food supply. Uh, but they've been there for thousands of years and somehow have managed not to get to this such a boom and bust situation that there's any record of the populations crashing before. So there seems to have been fox, there's evidence of, you know, fossil record kind of evidence of foxes having been there continuously for 10 to 20,000 years, depending on which island. So I'm, I'm not sure how that works, uh, what the dynamics are, but I, it seems not to be. Uh, now what we're more worried about is Humans just keep introducing factors that, even innocently, that they might not realize are going to throw some ecosystem off balance, and then the trickle effect, you know, then, or the domino effect is probably more appropriate, then, you know, the foxes or one of the other species is affected. Or uh, fire is one of the big concerns. In fact, the last meeting I went to, one of the guys put up a map where he had looked at, because Southern California has a lot of wildfires, and they had had a particularly bad wildfire year. So there was a map of the mainland that, you know, like marked off. This was the number of, this was the acreage that was burned this year. Took that and superimposed it over the islands. And it was, it would, it would have, it was bigger than any of the islands. And so the point he was making is that if you had a wildfire fire on any of those islands, it could potentially wipe out the entire island. And so even when we built the captive breeding facilities, we always had two of them at different locations because they were always worried about wildfire. So something like that, I think, is a much more imminent threat. Yeah. I don't know, but there is a really nice book that was written about the Channel Islands that looked at that kind of history and the evidence that archaeologists and paleontologists have pulled, pulled together and the conjecture that they have, and that is so far outside my field of expertise. Um, but if you want to contact me, if you're interested in following up, I don't remember right now the name of the book, but it's on my bookshelf, and I could give you that information if you wanted to follow up on it. But there are people who've looked in great detail at the history of the islands, not just for the foxes, but especially for Native Americans who lived there and at what era they settled it and you know, what the history was and what animals they were associated with. But there seems to be a belief that either foxes followed them or there was some so association, but it may depend on which paleontologist you read. I'm not sure. Over here. Uh, yeah, only those. And there are two other islands in that chain, but they're so small, they probably can't support a viable population of foxes. They're just so little. They couldn't support enough for it to be a genetically viable population, is our guess. No, no foxes on any of those. No. Yeah. I'm not a population geneticist. The... People who work with the zoo community, when they're setting parameters and targets for managing zoo populations, uh, 300 is often a number that's used that if you've got at least 300, depending on how many founders, because if the more founders you had originally, then the more genes you've got in that gene pool and so the more flexibility you have. And so then sometimes you can get by with fewer but I think, I don't know if Louise has any other thoughts on that. Yeah. I think 300 is often considered a minimum. But I'm sure there are different factors involved uh, 
that could make, you know, could affect that as well. But I think the minimum number I ever remember hearing for what's considered carrying capacity, like San Miguel is the littlest, or no, San Nicolas is the littlest, San Miguel is next. And San Miguel probably had, they, they're guessing, three or 400 animals before the problems began. San Nicolas has fewer than that. I think they got like 250 or so, but they are also documented to be really inbred. So it's like everybody's just waiting for a catastrophe to hit there because at least the molecular genetics that was done on them shows them to be very inbred. In fact, they're concerned that they might have in the past gone through some kind of bottleneck, uh, maybe with distemper or something, that reduced the numbers to the point that, you know, they're really homozygous, homo homogeneous now, yeah. But when you've got small islands, you've got a vulnerable population, yeah. Um, well, the three northern islands for sure, and Catalina has some monitoring going on, and Clemente, well, has some monitoring going on. I don't think they're monitoring foxes on San Nicolas right now. Um, that's where all the cat work was going on. Uh, but I haven't heard anything from them recently about doing fox monitoring, but they may be. I actually haven't gone to the meeting the last two years because our data collection had ended, so I get reports, but when you're sitting there, you pick up a lot more information. So I'm not as certain about Nicholas right now. Any more questions? That's it. Well, thanks so much.